I think my preference would have been to have a trade negotiator brought in and bring the whole process together a lot more. Well, the UK did go into the negotiations assuming, at least on the political level, that the EU's own economic interests in maintaining the closest possible relationship would trump everything else. Brexit perplexit. But it hasn't worked out like that. Charles Grant says the priorities guiding the EU side are not quite what most Brits were expecting. I would have wished the EU to be more focused on trade and investment. But what's been driving the EU has been politics, precedent and principles. Uh, the politics is that Brexit must be seen to carry a cost. The precedent is important that if the British are allowed to be in the single market for goods without accepting free movement, then the Swiss might ask for the same deal or somebody else will ask for the same deal, which is a worry for the EU. And the principles are that the four freedoms are indivisible, the freedom of movement of people, capital, goods and services. And if the British want some of those freedoms but not the others, that's unacceptable. So, as soon as Theresa May set out a series of red lines shortly after becoming Prime Minister, including leaving the single market and the customs union, and ending freedom of movement and the direct jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, well, negotiating options began to shrink. Matthew Elliott is dreaming of what might have been. Were you to imagine perhaps a Prime Minister a bit like a Donald Trump character to have taken the negotiation? You know, how would he have done it? He would basically have triggered Article 50 and said, right, we're leaving in two years' time. We're going to prepare for a no deal. And by the way, if you want to come over and talk with us about the money we give you guys and the other benefits you get from the UK being a member of the EU, we're all ears. Come and talk to us. But otherwise, we're preparing for that no deal Brexit in two years' time. And we'll start our trade negotiations with the rest of the world as well. And that would have been a very hardball way of doing it. I think the government tried to do it in a much more softball way, approaching the negotiations much more in good faith. I think that's something that's been slightly taken advantage of by the EU. But as we reach the end, I think the government's toughening up. Do you think the Donald Trump approach would have been a good idea? Looking back, I think hardball would have been a better way forward. And why not? We're one of the big guys. Or are we? The Brexiteers believe this is a chance for global Britain to reassert itself. But Charles Grant argues that one of the more painful episodes of the last couple of years has been discovering the limitations of British power, based on the inconvenient truth that they are now bigger than us. I think it's very difficult for the British to accept that they're not the stronger partner in the negotiation. Look at the way they've dealt with the Irish over the issue of the famous Irish backstop. Probably for the first time in the history of Europe, in a, a sort of diplomatic issue between the UK and Ireland... Ireland's obviously only been independent for 100 years. Ireland is in a much stronger position than the UK. Ireland sets the terms and the UK has to follow the Irish terms because Ireland has the whole EU behind it. But alongside the power politics, it's also the devil in the detail. Some of the most baffling parts of the negotiations have been about the UK extricating itself from all the economic and regulatory links that have been built up over many years of membership of the single market. These are complex legal and business issues, which, says Swati Dingra, will have a profound effect on the UK economy and its all-important services sector. We should always remember that less than 10% of the population today works in manufacturing in the UK. The rest of the people are employed in the services sector. But how much do we hear of services actually in the Brexit deal, even today? Now, why has it taken so long? for this idea of complexity to really pervade the political debate. It seems to me that there have been people going out of their way to say, this is going to be easy. I always find it really disturbing when I hear people say those things for the reason that even sort of in the run-up to the referendum, a lot of us as academics came out to say that, in fact, this was going to be a very complex process for the reason that we're talking about thousands and thousands of pages of legislation that need to be uprooted and rewritten. These things never work smoothly. There'll always be back and forth about it because we're no longer talking about just market access. We're actually talking about regulators talking to each other. But the time for talk, at least on issues of separation, is running short. March the 29th, set as the end of the Article 50 period, is fast approaching. Big Ben has always been a symbol of tradition and reassurance in Westminster. Not always a leisurely pace, but a promise of continuity all the same. But the Great Bell has been silenced over recent months, its tower covered in scaffolding. Brexit has been driven instead 
by more of a cacophony. Why? Well, because Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty sets a very rigid framework. And then the UK triggered it without really knowing what it wanted. Even the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, began hearing things. The clock is ticking very fast. That's why there are efforts to buy more time. It's why talk of extending Article 50 and delaying Brexit grows louder by the day. Even if a deal emerges miraculously at the last minute, there will be a lengthy transition period to tie up loose ends of every shape and size. But time pressure, says Nairi Woods, has made everything more difficult, given the scale of what's being attempted. If we take seriously a desire by Brits to change Britain's relations with the European Union, then it needs to be a serious plan. I think the biggest problem with the way the project of reorganising Britain's relations with the European Union has taken place is that it's a ridiculously short time. You can't build relations over 40 years and then just smash them overnight. Then criticism has to be directed at the EU as well as at the UK, doesn't it? I mean, both sides seem to have perhaps disregarded what the other side will be able to accept. That's the problem of suddenly springing a new direction on both Britain and on the European Union, because nobody's had time to line their ducks up. And so everybody's just scrabbling for their own interests. I think it's perfectly legitimate for Britain to want to reorganise its relations with the European Union, but we have to permit our partners to do the same and to organise a new relationship which is still based on trust but which permits Britain to do what British people want it to do. Doing what the British people want, if only we knew what that actually was. Two years on, the divisions caused by Brexit are as deep as ever, so perhaps it's hardly surprising that it's been neither easy nor quick. If it were done, when tis done, then twere well, it were done quickly. Now there's a thought. How would Shakespeare write Brexit? A comedy of errors? all's well that ends well. In fact, Brexit Day, when or if it comes, is only the end of Act One. As Shakespeare never wrote, you ain't seen nothing yet. Goodbye.